What impact has ID noticed since adding a PA to the service? Yeah, this is all work done before I got there by Melissa and the team, but they actually looked at the data and collected the data and I'm not going to know the study as well as Melissa would, but the gist of it was that they could show that when they got the PA in ID, the patient time of admission and the time to being discharged home was decreased by, I think, a couple of days at least. And this is, the physicians will tell you in plain language, before they had a PA, physicians would put in an ID consult and it might sit there more than a day before they could get to your patient. So this is one extra day of you maybe not knowing whether to start antibiotics, which antibiotics to start, right? But now with the PA, that never happens. We're able to see all of the consults if they come, you know, they come in between 8 and 5.30 at night, and you know that we're going to come up with a plan by the end of that day for your patient. And I think that by having a PA on the way, the reason they were able to get them out of hospital quicker is we come up with a plan for, are you going to go home with an IV and a PICC line? Who's going to follow you up? What imaging are you going to need? And I help arrange all of that. Um, so I think that those are the reasons that I know that if I had to quit the job tomorrow, they would definitely be advertising for another PA to take my place. It's the kind of thing that they'll never be able to live without now. Mm -hmm. And um, do you contribute to resident teaching? That's the wonderful thing. Uh, when I first talked to Melissa DeClo about this job, she said I don't work nights and I don't work weekends, and I knew that was the job for me, so it's, it's good. Great. And how often do you liaison with your supervising physician? Yeah, we have the kind of relationship where we're in constant uh, contact with each other anyway by text. Um, even if it's like, do you want a coffee, you know, this morning. So I feel very comfortable uh, changing some patients' antibiotics, but others, I feel like I want to chat with them first, but it isn't even a chat. It's like, can I change that urtapenem to Piptazo? And often the physician is already looking on the computer themselves at the new patients. So we're, we're totally in sync. It isn't the kind of thing, like they've never said to me, Maureen, I don't ever want to see you again you know, stopping the antibiotics until you talk to me. That's not, it's just kind of evolved gradually as I gain more confidence, then I do more things independently. But I also, uh, as I gain more confidence, it hasn't stopped me from being able to consult them when I just want that second opinion and that blessing. Um, so I, I actually feel I have as much autonomy as I need. Uh, and, and that's because I have a great relationship with all the doctors that I work with, and that's because the PA who came before me had already laid that groundwork for me. And does it differ a lot between the three docs that you work with? Um, they differ in that one of them likes to, me to let them know when I've seen a new patient right away, because we call those the one-offs. We want it, he, he would rather hear about the new patients as I do them through the day because he has so many other responsibilities in the hospital. Whereas a couple of the other doctors that I work with, they'd rather I see them all in the morning, have lunch, and then let's sit down at one o'clock and let's go over everything all at once. So it's kind of like a, a bolus of patients and follow-ups at one o'clock. And then we go around rounding on them all together. And then I get back to my desk and I can dictate all my notes. Um, so it's just it's just how they prefer to or organize their day. It really doesn't have anything to do with them not trusting that I haven't done something right in the morning. You know what I mean? It's, it's physician preference. Fair enough. And um, what's your interaction like with the nurses on the floor or great. other healthcare providers? Absolutely great. And I have to say that because I, um, I'm a consulting service and I don't really have to hang out in a specific ward all the time, I'm all over the hospital from the oncology respirology ward to the emergency department. But I, we have PAs in our hospital who are in internal medicine are, and basically spend whole days on the wards. And those nurses on those wards already are used to the PAs interacting with them and helping them. And the, the thing about the nurses is I spend more time talking to them about what did the bowel movements look like this morning? Did this patient have a fever this morning? And I don't really have to instruct nurses to do something because it's all done electronically. 
All of our orders are electronic, so if I want a, an antibiotic stopped and another one started, I put that into the system, and the nurses don't care who put it in. It comes up in their system, and they do it. Uh, same PSWs, uh, we have RPNs and RNs. Um, obviously, physio and social work and OT I work, I work with or interact with, but this idea of will they take orders from me is not an issue in our hospital because of the electronic record, but also because of the hard work that's already been done to help all of the other allied health understand what PAs do. Any tips for hospitals that are looking to integrate PAs on how they can foster that kind of environment? Um, I Only in that, you know, do some education ahead of time. Uh, encourage allied health to talk to their friends and colleagues in other hospitals where there are already PAs. Show them the data that shows that PAs don't actually take away nursing jobs. Like there's absolutely no evidence that we've we've uh, taken away nurse practitioner or nursing jobs. And if you talk to a few who've had them for a while, I think they'll tell you that, oh my God, I love having the PA because I can never reach the physician, but I always can reach the PA. So that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. And um, what can patients expect um, from, your, from their interactions with you on, uh, on the ID service? I mean, I think that they can expect two things. They will see me almost every day and follow me along, but they will also um, have met the physician who supervises me. So that's something we always do on the first day. Uh, the physician will be there to answer their questions, but they know that when they see me after that, if they have a question that I don't have the answer to right off the bat, I'll speak to my physician and get back to them. A lot of times they will ask me questions that have nothing to do with their infection. A lot of times it's, and so, do you think they're going to take the gallbladder out during this uh, admission or are they going to make me wait? And I'm like, I have no idea. And no control over that. So a lot of it is just educating the patient about what I, can, what I have control over and what I don't. Um, because remember, we're seeing patients, yes, for their infection, but sometimes that's not all that's going on with them. They have a lot of other reasons to be in hospital. And then one other thing I want to add about me that's maybe different from other PAs is I do... In infectious diseases, you wouldn't think we see a lot of patients in, who are palliative, but sometimes we do see patients in that transition from active treatment to palliation, and they may have an underlying infection going on that has nothing to do with whether or how soon they're going to die. I let them know that I'm okay to talk about their death and their goals of care, and things like that. Even though it's not really my bailiwick, if they have questions around that, because I have an interest in palliative care and in dying, I let them know that it's okay to talk to me. And I, you can talk frankly to me about your fears because I've been there myself. And so maybe that's something that I'm adding to my practice that really has nothing to do with my role as an IDPA. So can you speak to how your scope of practice has changed from jobs and then from when you started ID to the end to, to now? Yeah, I think that it, it was very obvious, especially starting off in emergency medicine, that you weren't going to be able to walk in the door right after graduation and be able to start um, ordering imaging, like you're not going to be able to order an MRI or a CT with contrast right away. I mean, those are things that you want to be careful and know what the right indication is. And then all the PA students, when they graduate, they want to know what procedures you're doing. Like everybody is very procedure oriented when they come out of school. Um, so it's going to be gradual. The physicians are going to have to watch you do a couple and then they're going to be comfortable letting you do it. We didn't at Sunnybrook have official sign-offs like I need to see you do three and then you can do one alone. It was just sort of a discussion between you and the physician. Um, but your scope of practice definitely grew as you gained more experience and more confidence. Now I'm over in ID, and really for me, what would be a little beyond my scope of practice would no longer be, am I going to put a chest tube in? Because i got to tell you, I don't do that. We have people way better at doing that. My ID physicians don't do that. Um, the procedures that we do, we might do a little abscess draining here and there, and then obviously the fecal transplants. But for me, scope of practice would be, when am I going to be able to be confident enough to know when we have to pull out ivermectin 
for example, or colistin, which is the antibiotic of last resort and is terribly toxic. You know, so we have ID pharmacists we work with as well. And what I noticed with my physicians is they wouldn't even start those things without first talking to the ID pharmacists and discussing, yeah, do we really want to pull this out? What do we got to look for? Um, so that's scope of practice in the ID world, which students are probably listening and going, well, that's kind of boring. But really, for me, it's not. Those are, those are the exciting things. So scope of practice hasn't really, is not as much of an issue for, I think, someone in a consult service like me as it would be where you're doing a lot of procedures in like an emergency medicine scenario. If a hospital is interested in adding a PA to their infectious disease service, what are some steps they should take or some considerations hmm. they should think about? Yeah. Um, my boss, uh, having already had Melissa before me, uh, told me that he would like to send me to our microbiology lab, uh, which is way uptown, uh, for a week of just watching how microbiology works at the bench side. So I went for a week and watched them, you know, take the plates with the agar and put the specimen on it and put it in, you know, the different machines that they have and how they get answers. I have to say in retrospect, if I, if they have to do it over again, I think I went too soon in my, uh, I had really just started. And what would probably have been better would be for me to become more familiar with the different uh, organisms that we would be dealing with and the different antibiotics that they use to see what's susceptible and what's not, because that's how you, you uh, find out what's resistant, and then go. So it, it almost would have been better a year in, into things. Um, so that would be one thing. Yes, they, they're going to need to learn more about microbiology. Um, but first, give them some practice just with the simple kinds of infections that you're going to run across in the hospital and get comfortable ordering the drugs. It was a long time before, like now I don't have to look up the dose for very many antibiotics anymore. They are there. But if you ask me now what dose we used to give even for, you know, Tylenol 3s when we send people home, I don't know if I remember that. It's amazing how the brain takes out the superfluous information that isn't needed anymore, because I don't order Tylenol for people anymore. So um, that's what I would, I would say to them, you know, your PA, it will take time, but eventually they'll get very comfortable doing that. And I can't reiterate enough, if an ID doctor has ever had a resident, like an R4, who really took to ID and they were wishing they could stay around because it was so nice having them see patients and making your life easier, that's what a PA could do for you. Um, so I would encourage, and that's really all there is to it. It's, it's not rocket science.